Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Jacksonville History Show. I'm Harry Reagan. Tonight, we take you back to the early days of broadcasting. We have an interview with Norm Davis, who worked at WRUF in Gainesville and WJXT TV4 in Jacksonville. Norm played a key role in the journalism that helped bring us Jacksonville's consolidated government. Here's our interview. It started in high school. I <coughs> finished high school in Palatka. And it worked out that in my senior year of high school, I only had to go to school for three hours a day because in the prior years, I had accumulated some extra credits by taking extra courses. So I had a half a day free in my senior year of high school. And I became involved with a local radio station in Palatka and as a uh, sort of a part-timer, but I was doing all kinds of things on the air. I was a disc jockey and I was reading rip and read news and, and, and doing baseball broadcasts and all of that. And how did you get that job? I just went down and knocked on the door. And, and they I put had, you in front of a microphone. Yes, they did. Well, it was a very small market and a very small radio station. And they weren't looking for, you know, people with lots of uh, experience and, and, and that sort of thing. And so, to my surprise, they just took me in and put me on the air. And I was there for a full year. And you did a little bit of everything, including yes. sleeping out and... <laughs> yes, all of the above. <laughs> right. And I... Then a, a, an amazing thing happened that prolonged my... that really put me on the road in broadcasting in Palatka on Sunday afternoons. This was a daytime radio station, by the way. It was only sunrise to sunset. 250 watts. 250 watt station, not very big. But on Sunday afternoons, we would broadcast uh, the local professional baseball game in the Florida State League. And I was tapped to go out to the baseball stadium and do the play-by-play, -play, and I did. This was the Palatka, what? I, th I Eagles or I think it was uh, I think it was the Palatka Azaleas or something like that. <laughs> I don't remember the name actually. But I was broadcasting one day, and uh, the man who was the general manager of a much larger radio station in Gainesville, the WRUF, was passing through Palatka that afternoon and listened on the radio and heard the broadcast. And on the following day, Monday, he called me from Gainesville told me he was a retired Army major who was running that station in Gainesville. And he asked me, uh, are you planning to go to college? And I said, I don't have any plans, because I didn't. I did quite well in high school grade-wise, but I simply didn't have uh, the, the motivational support in, in my home setting to encourage me to go to college. I said I would think about it. He said, why don't you come over and talk to me? So I did. I went to Gainesville and met him. He was a gruff, uh, retired Army major. And we talked for quite a while. And he said, well, let's, uh, let's go do an audition. And so they took me into a very, very large studio at that radio station in, in Gainesville. And I did an audition. And it was sort of a standard event. They handed me some scripts, you know, to read uh, news copy and to read uh, two or three commercials and some other uh, material. And then a uh, voice over the box told me to put the papers down, please. And the, the, the voice, uh, these were people in the control room who were watching and, and this, this uh, process. Uh, the man said, I'm going to give you uh, a topic in just a second, and I'd like to have you just talk uh, freely uh, and tell us everything you know about the safety pin. So I started talking about the safety pin. And I just made up all kinds of things uh, about its history, its appearance, its materials, its use in war. And, and how long did this go on? It, Fifteen minutes later, <laughs> this voice came over the box and said, thank you very much, that'll do. <laughs> Enough of that already. Because I was still going on. So they, they told me that would, that would say, and they offered me a job. And what that demonstrated was that I could ad lib, like I'm doing now. But I took that job, and I was in, I, 
I di did move to Gainesville, enrolled in the University of Florida, a, a landmark event in my life, to say the least. And I worked for that station for four and a half years. For two years uh, in my junior and senior years in, in college, uh, I was uh, uh, helping in the broadcast of the University of Florida football game. With Otis Boggs. With Otis Boggs. Otis did the play-by-play, -play and I did what was then called the color. And we traveled with the, the team wherever it went. Went to Los Angeles twice and, and lots of other places and did broadcasts. In those days, there was no television. And th it, those were the days before there was a national championship, needless to say, needless or an to say. SEC championship Correct. even. But uh, there was no television, so radio was a, was a big vehicle at that time. And Florida, the, the Florida Football Network has everybody listened to that. 65 stations scattered throughout the state. Yeah. And everybody listened. And so we had a huge audience. One time, we were up in Auburn doing a game, and Otis became ill right after we went on the air for the game. And a, a timeout occurred, and he got up from his seat and said, I can't do this anymore. Come over here. <laughs> and so I moved over into his seat and put on his microphone and did my first big-time football play-by-play -play and actually did a pretty good job, I think. I had to do the the foot the play by play and all the, everything else. I had to do the, the halftime discussions, and I was exhausted at the end of the broadcast. But uh, I I enjoyed that actually. Well, uh, so you continued at WRUF and uh, graduated yes. University of Florida with a degree in journalism. One of the things I did, by the way, in the journalism school was. At that time, journalism was concentrated entirely on print, newspapers and magazines. And the dean of the journalism school was at that time a, a man named Ray Weimer. Right. And I began to talk with him about why don't we, why don't why don't we change the curriculum to include some radio news uh, training, and he did, and he began to develop a broadcast aspect of the journalism program at the university. And now it's a full-fledged part now of the school. A, it's a full-fledged telecommunications yeah. uh, school instead of mere journalism. Well, at some point you uh, ended up in Jacksonville. Yes, when I finished uh, at, at the University of Florida, I had to go in the Air Force for two years as an ROTC uh, commitment. I went in as an officer and I was stationed for a year in Alaska and a year in Texas. And at the conclusion of the two years, I had planned to return to Gainesville. They wanted me to come back. And even though I was going to be no longer a student, to work for the radio station again, WRUF. So I was headed back to Gainesville and actually stopped by and talked to the general manager and others. And I was getting settled and getting relocated out of the Air Force. But at that time, I became aware for the first time of television. And I began to watch, for the first time, broadcasts out of Jacksonville on, on what was uh, then WMBR-TV. And uh, I learned that some of the people I had known at the University of Florida were up at that television station in various positions. And I uh, put in a call to a, a fellow who had worked in, at the radio station in Gainesville and was at that time the program director of Channel 4 in Jacksonville, and I arranged a meeting with him, came up to Jacksonville, and uh, we talked about a job. I had obviously no television experience at all, so he set me up in the studio for an audition in front of a camera. You didn't talk about safety pins no, again? No, no. <laughs> uh, uh, they, they had some commercials that I read and some other materials, and it was a fairly short audition and they offered me a job. By the time I got to Channel 4, which was in 1954, the station had been on the air for uh, three or four years and had developed a, 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 a set of systems and it, it was, it was operate, operating quite well by the time I arrived. And there was certainly no news department. Uh, and so I was just an announcer. And where was the TV station? Well, it was a, when I first uh, joined the station, it was located at the uh, south end of the Main Street Bridge, right close to the water. In a Quonset hut. 
Well, the transmitter was in a Quonset oh, hut, okay. but the studios were in a building very ad adjoining that roadway, right at the, at the foot of the bridge. And the big sign up on the building was WMBR-TV. And it was a good-sized building because it, we had a, a, a large studio. And it, was, it was also a radio operation in there at the time, WMBR Radio. So the, both the radio and TV operations were in the same location. But the transmitter was not far away, as you say, in a Quonset hut out on the south side. And then after about uh, a year and a half or so, maybe two years, the station was purchased by the Washington Post Company. And the Post uh, kept the same management in place. Glenn Marshall was the general manager for some time. They changed the, the call letters to WJXT. And they also changed the location. They built a new building out farther on the south side. And the entire operation was, and a new tower was built out there as well, which is still there. And then the whole operation was moved to that much, much larger, much more sophisticated place. This was a, an era of live television. There was no such thing as videotape. Correct. Uh, so talk, talk about that. There were a lot of local programs because yes. there was a limited amount of network programming, I guess. Yes. Yes, live television is a special animal. Uh, there was no videotape until, I think, maybe the middle part of the 1960s. So everything else that we did was live. And when you're live and something wrong happens, all you can do is go straight ahead. And as you said, there was a, a good amount of local programming, entertainment programming, um, musical programming, uh, uh, country music. There was a, 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 a band headed by a man named Toby Doughty. And it was, he had a popular show in prime time, prime time being from 7 or 8 o'clock p.m. up till 11 or 11.30. So in doing those kinds of live programs, because they were production-wise uh, more complex than, than usual, there had to be an adequate amount of time to rehearse and not only rehearse the performers, but rehearse the cameras and rehearse the people handling the microphones, which at that time were not like these. They were on, on, uh, on pedestals and, and you could swing them around. Mm -hmm. So it, was, it worked. It wasn't perfect. The this, this station at that time had some very fine directors. The directors were the people who in the control room were directing the production and go here and do that, pan left, pan down, and, and controlling the lighting and everything. Uh, the most prominent director we had at the time was a man named Windsor Bissell. And Windsor, when he would go out and, and rehearse these programs before they went on the air, I used to admire watching him do that. He was so smooth and so talented. He would get everything in place. And then when the program went on the air, all these things he had set up and arranged would fall into place and, and in a very natural, smooth way. It was very good. It was interesting to watch. Commercials were live. Yes, they were. Yes, they were. And, uh, and, and people weren't as fastidious about separating. Uh, there would be a news anchor with a product on the desk yes. in front of him. Yes. So there wasn't quite as much separation between uh, advertisers and well, let's talk, about, let's talk about those news broadcasts, because in those days, there was no news department. In the 1950s, there was no news department. But there was a news program. CBS had a 15-minute news program every evening from 6 to 6.15. Douglas Edwards. Douglas Edwards. And at 6.15 to 6.30 was the Channel 4 news block. So there was five minutes of news, five minutes of weather, five minutes of sports. And the news at that time was, as much as anything, taken off the, uh, the tickers, the United Press and the Associated Press. And occasionally, there would be uh, some useful piece of local news that would weave its way into the production. But it was, it was superficial news, because that's all we could do with the resources that we had. And that's why, as 1960 approached, 
there was some serious thinking going on about improving that by establishing an actual professional news department. And as I've mentioned before, in 1960, that took place. And uh, the, the key person there that we want to acknowledge would be Bill Grove, uh, a legendary figure in local. I could not say too much about Bill Grove. Bill uh, had no television experience when he came there. What did he do before? He was a teacher in Pennsylvania. And he taught, as I recall it, for several years. And for reasons I, I don't remember, he moved down to South Flo to, to Jacksonville and uh, had his family here with him. But he became legendary, as you say. Bill, when we formed the news organization, Bill was quite pleased that I was eager to join and take part in that. And together, we really structured the, the, the place. And he was a... A, a very strong and effective leader. He also was a very effective man on the air. He anchored all of the news programs, particularly the ones at 6 o'clock, because by that time we had extended the 15-minute block to a 30-minute block. And he, he did for a while, for a short while, he did the 6 o'clock news and the 11 o'clock news, but that changed, and he began to assign other people to, to handle the anchor job on the 11 o'clock broadcast. You're watching an interview with Norm Davis, TV journalist, on the early days of broadcasting. More of our interview after this. Jacksonville Historical Society, preserving your city's history, protecting your city's treasures, advocating the restoration of Jacksonville landmarks, archiving a century of historical documents, collecting rare photographs, tens of thousands, creating the Merrill Museum House, piece by piece, restoring old St. Andrew's Church, receiving Florida Historical Society's top honors, publishing historical books, elegantly crafted, producing video histories, dramatically told, educating our citizens for decades, enlightening the generations to come, sponsoring tonight's special television presentation, and offering you the opportunity to become a part of Jacksonville history. Call 665-0064, visit jackshistory.com, and become a member of the Jacksonville Historical Society, celebrating 80 years serving our community. Now back to our interview with Norm Davis. He's talking about legendary TV4 anchorman Bill Grove. His imprint on this community through the, the operations of that news department has been profound. And he certainly worked hand in glove with me on all the projects that I was doing. Because you have to think about it. You're inventing something new that, you know, a, a, a news operation that, was, uh, that had never been done before. So thank goodness he got it right. It not only was inventing and putting in place a news organization that had never existed, it was putting in place a news organization that was very strong and very effective and very candid. Well, he was all, also good. You, you said you, you, know, you were in print journalism in school because there wasn't that much right. interest in broadcasting. Uh, in the early days, you and Bill look to print journalism to staff the TV station because you were concerned about getting people who were really serious journalists. That's a very good point, and that's correct. Because when we began to look for, I was doing the editorials, and I was in charge of producing the documentaries. We needed reporters to do the investigative special reports. And we wanted people who, who knew what they were doing. And we looked around. And there were no people in television or radio who had any experience like that. So we went out and recruited people who had that sort of experience, as you say, in the print media, in newspapers. And over a period of those years, we brought in a number, quite a number of people who, who had that kind of experience in, in newspaper journalism and put them on the air. 
because we were more concerned not with how they looked or how they performed, but by what they had and how they said it. There was film. There was film. But in, it, in it had to be processed? Days. Yes. And so it took a while before you could get film on the air. Yeah, it took, uh, we had a processor in the building. So it took maybe 30, 35 minutes to process a roll of, of 16 millimeter film. But then it had to be edited yes. and spliced together and, and, and that sort of thing. And it did take some time. So it, you're quite right. There was no way to get, to, to get, to get instant exposure to what you brought in. Uh, that changed in the 1970s with the advent of uh, electronic cameras. And that was a profound revolution in television news, not only locally, but nationally as well. And in that case, you had uh, videotape in the camera. You still needed a certain amount of selection and editing, which, but it only took a couple of three minutes to do that, and no developing time. Now, talk a little bit about uh, some events that led up to an important thing in Jacksonville's history, consolidation. You. Uh, pioneered editorials. TV stations around the country, not many, I think, were doing editorials when you started. That's correct. So you couldn't call up a, another TV station and find out how to do it. There were very few that were that interested in serious journalism. That's, that's true. It is true, though, that there was a station in Miami at the time, WTVJ, which had been on the air a, a year or two longer than WJXT, and they had been doing editorials in Miami, and strong ones. Uh, I had not seen a lot of those. I'd, I'd seen a couple here and there. But you're right. When we did it, we had to start figuring out how to do it. And it did take some time to get it right. The two names that people would think about if they looked into uh, TV history would be Ralph Rennick in Miami, Channel 4 in Miami, and Bill Grove here. That's right. And, uh, and then documentaries were another thing that uh, were kind of a staple with Channel 4. And uh, half-hour documentaries, something that you don't see that much of these days. And you went around the world, all kinds of foreign countries and so forth, doing documentaries. I went uh, abroad on three occasions to do documentaries, and all of these were in the 1960s. The first place I went was to Berlin. <coughs> At the time, the Berlin Wall went up in 1961. Um, the, uh, it was a highly, highly dramatic event in Europe and certainly in Berlin because of the Soviet presence. And uh, the U.S. Conference of Mayors set up uh, a special trip to Berlin to take uh, armloads of letters and, and commendations and things from other mayors to present to Mayor Willie Brandt in, in the city of Berlin. And the president of the Conference of Mayors at that time happened to be the mayor of Jacksonville, Hayden Byrne. So that gave Bill Grove uh, the opening to say, let's go cover that presentation to, in Berlin and have a look at the wall. So I went with a cameraman. Uh, to Berlin, my first time abroad, and it was uh, we went. It was a long trip, and we went straight to the uh, city hall in Berlin, and there was a big gathering in a conference room, and Willie Brandt was there, and and uh, Burns handed him this pile of letters from American mayors. It was a very emotional thing, and we shot that, and then we, uh, my cameraman and I, left uh, the the mayor delegation to go their own way. And we went over to East Berlin and shot film. We went down to the Berlin Wall itself. There was no wall at that point. There was only barbed wire strung up and down to divide the city in two. And lots of, uh, of military, uh, armed military people on the other side, on the East Berlin side, were lined up all along that, that new uh, wall to be. So we crossed over into East Berlin with some trepidation, I, I will say, and spent the better part of a day over there in the, in the most incredible place to be in contrast to West Berlin. West Berlin looked like any modern city in America. 
East Berlin looked like the war, World War II had ended the day before. What kind of issues were difficult to cover? Taboos, sacred cows, if any. At Channel 4? Yes. <clears throat> the only taboo that I remember experiencing was that we could only cover issues involving race on a very superficial basis. It was uh, a sad circumstance, to say the least, because we had nearly absolute freedom to cover everything else and anything else, and we did. And Jacksonville has had some uh, dark chapters in, in its history because of civil rights protests and so forth. And we did not cover them well. Nor did anyone else. Nor did anyone else. For that matter. And I, I want to go ahead and be honest about this because we didn't cover it because the general manager did not want it covered. This was a, the man who had given us what, as I said a moment ago, a total flexibility and freedom to cover problems and issues in that community. So this was a blind spot, this perhaps. For him. And, and, and he was a great uh, civic leader and, and a good general manager in almost every other respect. Yes, Signed the, manif the Yates Manifesto. Yes, he did. Along with other uh, important Well, he, he came to his adult life from Alabama. And he, had, he was shaped by his upbringing there and by his family circumstances in Alabama. And he was what he was. And he, was, he would not bend at all on those things, even when we talked to him about that. So I have to acknowledge that reality. But the other larger reality was that we could do what we wound up doing in exposing problems and difficulties in this community. That was a conversation with Norm Davis on the early days of broadcasting in Jacksonville. This show will soon be posted on our website, the uh, Historical Society website, jackshistory.com. And that's our show for tonight. Thanks for watching. So long, everyone. An interview with Norm Davis, editorial director of WJXT in the 50s and 60s. Norm, take us back to the days when Channel 4 got involved with investigative reporting and paved the way to some extent for consolidation. Sure. <clears throat> I think the place to begin is to talk about the, the uh, development of the station's first uh, news department, because until 1960, it had none. Uh, Bill Grove was, uh, had been with the station for quite a few years at that point, that point being 1960. But uh, there had been no news department with adequate resources and, and the planning and development agendas and things like that. But in 1960, that came to pass. And at that point in time, I had been doing general purpose uh, activities for the station, and I moved into that news department with Bill and a number of other people. And what we did was, at that time, commit to, uh, particularly in, in, the, uh, in the areas where I would be active, to doing editorials with some regularity, meaning two or three times a week, doing uh, documentaries, half-hour programs, and occasionally a one-hour program on various topics and issues. And the third uh, dimension had to do with investigative news reports. These would be uh, four or five-minute, sometimes six-minute reports that uh, were the result of some very serious and professional digging and investigation into problems in the community. So we committed at the outset to doing those things. And it, it needs to be said that at that time, none of us had had any experience in working for a television news organization. So I had a journalism degree, but I had not had any serious opportunity to apply it. And there weren't many role models elsewhere no. in television. No, there really were not, particularly not on a local level. And I'm not sure at that point in time how many uh, local stations in America actually had active and and, and uh, developed news uh, organizations. But we, uh, Bill Grove and I, committed at that time to do these things aggressively, 
and professionally and carefully and seriously. Now those are the words that I, I think fit, and that's what we did. So we, in learning how to do those things, we took those, those, those criteria into the, into the job. So starting in 1960, we began to do uh, those three things. We began to do editorials and, and documentaries, and the investigative reports came along a little bit later because it took time to get talent on board, uh, people who had the ability to get out and, and do serious digging and inquiry, and then assemble what could be said to be an investigative report. Now, once we had created that, uh, that set of instruments, we began to look around in the community to see what it is we should cover. And oh my, did we find a vast array of problems and issues. And let me just touch on a few of those, because at that point in time, the political community in, in Jacksonville and, and Duval County uh, was, was not active at all. And the problems I'm going to start mentioning now were in many ways ignored, not only by the political uh, structure in, in the community, but by the business community. And it was just a, a passive, uh, benign environment. But that environment contained a lot of extremely serious problems. Uh, perhaps the most prominent problem at that time was the, the school system, which uh, had been uh, poorly financed over a generation and was in terrible, terrible shape. And as early as 1959, the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools warned the Duval County, which operated this, the, the, had the school district, that disaccreditation could be on the horizon. And losing accreditation from the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools uh, could be a, a, a cataclysm, because the Southern Association had never done that in its history, had never stripped a county a school system of, of that kind of, of, uh, of labeling. And that did happen. That did happen. Accreditation. That did happen. It happened, as I remember, about 1961 or possibly 1962. The other thing that went in tandem with that school problem was the tax base issue in the community. There had not been a reassessment of property values in more than 20 years, none at all which means that the tax base kept getting narrower and narrower. And whereas the base should have been, and I don't have numbers at hand, should have been much, much broader given the realities of the time, the tax base was very narrow. And the millage rates, I mean, in order to extract revenues out of a tax base that narrow, the, the millage rates were very, very high. So the people on the tax rolls who were paying uh, uh, meaningful taxes were paying indeed. They were, they were supporting the rest of, of the community, and, and that did not work. And the, the, the shortage of revenues affected a lot of different aspects of public life in the community, but primarily the school system. And so when disaccreditation did take place, uh, it amounted to what I consider to be a major shock to the people who lived here, and rightly so. They began suddenly to fear that the colleges and universities would not accept applicants graduating from high schools that had no accreditation by anybody, because accreditation was a national process and had been in, in history for, I don't know, half a century or, or longer. So there was that huge problem, and we began to deal with that uh, in very direct and tangible ways because uh, it was right there on our, on our doorstep. There were other problems as well, and we began to find, uh, I'm going to use the word corruption, because it was there, and it was there in abundance. As we began our inquiries, uh, we found uh, the corruption to be pri predominantly in the city of Jacksonville to a lesser degree, but still there in the county. 
And as we began over a period of two, three, four years to dig into aspects of the way the city was operating, we turned over all kinds of stones and all kinds of things began to crawl out. So the, the corruption uh, applied to local government, but it wasn't corruption so much in the school system, it was just inadequate funding. And That's correct. Now there, uh, to touch on a point you raised, there was, there were some leadership issues in the school system. The, at that time, the school superintendent was elected. And the school superintendent, who had been in office for a long, long time, his name was Ish Brandt, had to look over his shoulder because he had to come up for re-election periodically. And there wasn't adequate leadership at the top of the system. In the course of events, uh, particularly after the disaccreditation, the system was changed and the superintendency became an appointive position. Uh, we editorially strongly supported that. Well, let, let's get back to the corruption, okay. which I don't think is uh, an inappropriate term of what was going on based on what I've learned subsequently. Right. Well, we began to find uh, a whole host of sort of fundamental problems. Purchasing, for example. Uh, the city in buying insurance, in buying motor vehicles, in, in purchasing other types of things that, that you need to operate a city, began to favor certain local businesses and would make purchases at, with very high awards without competitive bidding. And while the, the total dollar amounts that were being wasted at that time, as you look back on them years later, they don't seem to be very large. In that time, and in the context of that economy, those were big numbers. And we began to find over and over and over again that the purchasing uh, practices in the city were just horrible. And as we did these things, as we began to reveal these things and put these things on the air, the city officials didn't care. They weren't impressed at all with what we were doing. And, and I, I want to go ahead and say quickly that no other news organizations in the community were doing that. Uh, I think that was uh, very sad. But the, the, uh, the newspapers at that time were benign. They would uh, touch this or that, but they weren't digging as we were. And the other major television station in town, Channel 12, was not doing it either. So we were alone, and it was a little bit, a little bit testy to have nobody out there backing you up. And the corruption, uh, public officials were abusing the public trust. Absolutely. And, and of course, uh, you'll get to this, but some of them went to prison. Yeah, that, that comes a little bit later, but yes, they did. But the, the, the primary uh, point I would make at, at this place in the, in the history in, in the 1960s <coughs> was that the, the, the public officials didn't care. They were annoyed greatly by what we were doing. Uh, I, I've mentioned purchasing practices. There were many other types of practices, particularly within the city, to a certain extent within the county government as well. In the misuse of public employees, they used to use, the city used to use a lot of uh, public employees to go out and work actively in political campaigns. Um, but the, the misuse of money and the misuse of authority was rampant, and I, I'm not sure Florida had ever seen anything like that. And as we began to expose all of that, again, the city officials were just angry because we were doing it. And they weren't taking any steps whatsoever to respond to it, to us, or to deal with it and acknowledge, yep, there's a problem there. We need to change the, the, the system that we've been using uh, uh, to do that. And you, you were getting positive feedback from viewers. People oh, were yes. concerned, outraged. Let me yeah. tell you how positive that was. The television stations then, as now, do audience research to figure out what kind of audience you have and what they want, what they like and what they don't, and so on. Then you make programming decisions and, and even news decisions. What we began to discover uh, in 1962 and 3 and 4 and 65 from this research was that we had an enormous audience for our news programs. And 
by enormous, uh, I think we were talking, we had at, at points in time 85 or 90 percent of all the audience, the television audience at the time of these news programs were watching us because they, they were very keenly interested in what we were doing and what we were revealing. And we began to get feedback in other ways, not only in research data, but just in letters and comments and even people on the street applauding us for what we were doing. And, and the community began over these, this period of years to, to really become aroused and, and, and angry about what they were seeing. And that led to several things. Well, uh, was there ever any negative feedback, let's say, from advertisers? Uh, but maybe that was offset by the size of the audience, which they realized. I think you put your finger on it. I, I don't recall any negative impact from advertisers. I think advertisers want the biggest audience they can find, and we could provide it. And we should maybe mention the leadership of the station, Glenn Marshall, who uh, supported your efforts in Bell Grove. Glenn Marshall had been with, uh, with the television station from its very beginning. Going back to radio even before. Even back to radio before, uh, before the, the, the television station went on the air. He was a gentleman from Alabama. He was a southern, uh, almost an aristocratic fellow, but distinguished, respected in the community, in the business community. And once we began to get started with what we were doing with news, and as I tried to explain a few minutes ago, I think it was uh, somewhat novel and certainly aggressive. He supported that from day one. And he never, never uh, withdrew that support. And he got some pressure. Yes, he did. Uh, so I, I, I know from some public officials. Yes. And apparently was, managed to resist that pressure. Well, let me give you an example of that. Uh, somewhere, I would say, in 1964, we had been doing almost four years of heavy-duty investigative journalism. And at that point in time, the mayor of the city of Jacksonville, Hayden Burns, was running for governor. And he summoned me one day to his office in City Hall. And I went down there by myself, and he closed the door and he laid into me like nobody in my life ever has. He was, he was bitterly angry at what we were doing. And he was highly, extremely critical of me in particular because I was sort of the, sort of the, the symbol out there on the, on the screen. He told me I was ruining the city. I was giving the city a terrible reputation. We had dirty linen we were hanging out all over the place. And he went on and on with that that theme, and he told me that Northeast Florida had never had a governor, and, and by God, he was going to have one, and he was not going to let me stop that. And I, he did all the talking, and when he finally finished, I said, well, I'm simply doing a job, and I'll continue to do that job, and I'll try to be fair and, and honest all the way. And then the conversation ended and I left. And a week or two later, the mayor came down to the television station and met with Glenn Marshall, who was the general manager, in his upstairs office. I was not present for the meeting. I didn't know it had taken place. But after the meeting concluded, uh, Marshall invited me upstairs and told me that the mayor had come to see him and had complained bitterly about the news reports we were engaged in. And even to the point that he was banging on Glenn Marshall's desk. And I said, uh, how did you respond to all that? He said, I told him that you were doing a professional job. He said, uh, I told the mayor that if he could find errors and mistakes in what you were doing, he can let me know and we would look into it. But he said, I told the mayor we were not going to change anything that we were doing. Now, there's a particular documentary. People nowadays may not know what a documentary is because television doesn't do many of them. But there was a documentary called Government by Gaslight, which uh, is cited as one of the key uh, elements in, uh, in getting support for a new form of government. Yes. Let me give you a little bit of a context for that particular documentary, because in the course from 1960 until 
1968, which was when consolidation took place. We produced at least 40 documentaries, maybe 45. These were half-hour programs that concentrated on social or political issues. It was in uh, the very early part of 1965 that the business, a segment of the business community came to a realization that something needed to be done about the structure. And, and uh, annexation was failing, Yes, which, which would be one solution because you had this suburban growth outside the basic right. city. So, and it had been tried over and over, I guess. It had. Uh, I don't have any, uh, any clear recollection about uh, how often it was tried or, or whether, I don't think it succeeded very well. Mm -hmm. And it, it did not result, even if you had some annexation in the city, the structures would have stayed the way they were. And they were conflicting and, and, and not productive. But just prior to when we did that documentary that I'm going to touch on in just a minute, there was a major event in the community, in the business community, and that was when Claude Yates, who was an executive in, in terms of, uh, of, of Southern Bell here in, in the county, gathered together a group a couple, of a couple of dozen of major distinguished leading businessmen, and they talked about something needing to be done. And Yates took a piece of paper and wrote out sort of like a declaration of, of something. It, it came to be known as the Yates Manifesto. And it, it had to do with calling on the local legislative delegation to look, at, look into the prospects for a consolidation of the city and the county governments. Now, our documentary followed that by a couple of months. We had been thinking for some time about doing government by gaslight. And the reason we did was because we had done four or five years of heavy-duty investigative journalism, and nothing was happening. And we decided that it was time to say there's a much more fundamental problem here that is contributing to these terrible uh, governmental uh, financial practices and contributing to what came to be widespread corruption, political and criminal corruption. So we said, let's, let's call on the community to take a look at the structure of, these, of the city and the county. And so we did. And we produced the half-hour documentary called Government by Gaslight. And it was broadcast first, as I remember, in May of 1965. And it, we, we didn't focus on any particular uh, uh, issue having to do with the, these corruptions or other things. We focused on the structure. That was part of an oral history interview with Norm Davis, editorial director at WJXT in the 50s and 60s. And that's all the time we have for this Jacksonville History Show. For more information, call 665-0064 or visit our website, jackshistory.com. So long, everyone.